Hi guys, welcome to another Caternix Corner Live. Um, I hope you guys are all having a great day. Uh, how'd you like that new countdown timer? Pretty cool, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I got, I try to bring, you know, yeah. everybody that's been on the show in there, make it a little more interesting. Um, with me today are two very nice ladies from Australia. We have Tamara and Katia. Welcome ladies. Hi. Good morning. <laughs> Um, today's show we're going to be talking about uh, selective breeding and goal setting. Um, it's a topic that I think uh, everyone should be familiar with and uh, Tamara and Katia are very well versed in both these areas and will be sharing their knowledge with you. Um, we are going to be taking your questions later on in the show so as always if you would type the letter Q in front of your questions. Uh, it just helps me find them over the comments. Um, I do have a couple real quick announcements. Uh, big shout out to our sponsors, um, Hatching Time and uh, Southwest Game Birds. Uh, Southwest Game Birds, if you go to their website and use the coupon code Caternix Corner, you can get 10% off of any uh, purchase there. And also Hatching Time has donated another uh, $50 gift certificate I think it is yeah $50 gift certificate which we'll be giving given away tonight and you can use that over on their website at hatchingtime.com so also I'm going to be doing a video next week on uh, the hatching time cages um, and the replacement flooring that's available for those cages so keep an eye out for that one uh, also going to be giving away another Caternix Corner Live coffee cup tonight uh, to one lucky winner and I don't know if I've got moderators in here tonight or not. Let me take a quick peek. Yeah, Verna Young's in the house. So uh, uh, welcome to our moderators, Verna Young and Beth Reed. I don't know if Beth Reed is in here yet or not. Uh, appreciate it, Verna. And you know the routine. So I think that's about it for me. I want to make this uh, quick, guys, because we've got a lot of information uh, that we want to present to you tonight. Mm. And uh, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Tamara and Katia for their presentation. And then after that, we'll jump into the questions. So ladies, yeah. if you guys want, go ahead. Good morning, everybody. I'm Tamara Russell from Camilla Quail in WI, Western Australia. Good evening. <laughs> Good evening. Good morning. <laughs> Katia. Um, I'm Katia and I'm from Our Extraordinary Quail uh, and I live in Queensland, Australia. Um, 
I had a bit more of a longer introduction than Tamara did. Um, <laughs> so um, I've been actively breeding quail for about two years. Uh, I started off with just a handful of them of quail in a tiny backyard for eggs and something new for the kids and I to do. Uh, now we are living on one and a half acres and quail feature heavily in our daily lives uh, and our sustainability practices and things. Um, so I just wanted to give you all a little an Australian fact, just because, um, I don't know, I, I suppose most of the Katornix corn of yours are in the United States. So um, Tamara and I are both in Australia, uh, and Australia is about the same size as the mainland United States. And if you laid a map of Australia over the top of the United States, I live roughly on the border of uh, Michigan and Ohio with Canada. And Tamara lives somewhere in the ocean, a little bit west of Los Angeles and San Diego. So we're like really, really far apart. And we've never actually met in person. And until this week, uh, when we had our little test with Terry, we had actually never spoken verbally to each other. We definitely so have a fun but useless coffee. fact. <laughs> um, so today, Tamara and I would like to talk about selective breeding, goal setting, uh, how to achieve those goals, test breeding, and what the ideal or the optimal standard in quail is. So we're both quail breeders. We are working to better the domestic and the commercial species of Katornix. We have high standards. Uh, some people may, might say too high. Um, we do encourage others to have high standards too. We, are, we aren't just multiplying what's already out there. We are developing and bettering our own lines. And we'd like to teach you how to do that too. We think these skills are really important for breeders. So we'll talk to you about what we do and what we believe is right. But we also acknowledge that people keep quail for varied reasons. And some of what we talk about today might seem over the top or unnecessary uh, in say a situation where quail are being kept simply as pets for fun. Um, or when we're referring to cleaning up colours, for example, uh, that's not something that's necessarily going to apply to quail being kept for the meat only purposes, um, where other factors might be more important than colour. We also oh, yeah. appreciate that everyone likes different things. Uh, Tamara and I certainly have different tastes and we do things differently to each other, sometimes based simply on what appeals to us and what doesn't. Uh, so what I like to see in my quail might differ from what you like to see in your quail. And we'll go over some health and body structure type basics that are important for everyone, no matter the purpose of your quail. But the colour stuff can be subjective. So please do not feel like we are telling you to get rid of your loved pets because they don't fit the right colour profile or that they have an out of place white feather. You can keep your birds for whatever reasons. Um, and before we go any further, um, we need to talk about culling. That is an important um, topic that we will be mentioning a lot today. So Tamara is going to go over what culling yeah. actually means. We're specifically discussing selectively breeding to reach your goals today. So we are going to be talking about culling, but I'd just like to clarify that culling doesn't mean killing. It just means eliminating the bird from your breeding program. Uh, I have a, a lot of culls that I've had for years that are, are pets outside and I call them culls, but they're living a perfectly happy life. So when we say cull it, we don't mean kill it. You can if you, you butcher your excess, but it, that's not what we mean when we're referring to culling. We're just saying get it out of the, the breeding program because it's not gonna get you where you wanna be. Um, I'm going to first up, can we have the first picture, Terry? This is just addressing a frequently asked question, which is how to encourage broody hens. Now, I have an influx of broody hens at the moment. I've got four at the moment, and I've had up to eight broody at a time. And I just thought I'd quickly cover this at the start. 
there's a few things I've noticed over the years that encourage broody hens. I'm not saying you can make them go broody, but if you have a look at this picture, there's one thing in common with all the broody hens, which is that they're all in a white environment. I don't know why, but I've got six different coloured boxes in my big aviary and they all sit in the white ones and they've done that for years. So um, if you're going down the route of trying to, to get them to brood their own young, I think the white box is key. And the other thing is space and not too many roosters, so a good ratio. They won't go clucky if they're being harassed constantly by roosters. Uh, and if you do manage to get them to go clucky, don't try to move them. It is a tragic mistake. Every time it will snap them out of it. If they're not in a safe environment, block them off or move the other birds. Uh, I think that's pretty much it for, for that. I just, it's asked, it's asked so often, I, I thought I'd talk about it briefly because it's pretty cool to watch them hatch their own babies, but it seems to be a very rare occurrence for most people. Whereas yep. me, I can't get rid of them. <laughs> I <laughs> wish I could say that. Yeah, they just won't oh, I wish I had that <laughs> problem too. <laughs> I've got I've got four of them on day ten currently, and I have no idea what I'm going to do with them because they're sitting on about fifty eggs. <laughs> uh, next picture, please, Terry. That's my setup. This those two white boxes in the right hand corner are where mine go broody. Um, there was also a green box, a black box, and a few others that I took out to take the photo. Uh, but they consistently go broody, and those two white boxes, which are actually fridge shelves from our old fridge. Uh, Katie's setup is next, I think. Your um, Tamara, did you want to talk about um, a healthy and clean environment being um, an important factor in um, I, selective breed or in breeding in general? Yeah, well, I think it's just general care. Um, mine have mine go into this big pen when I'm not breeding with them. Uh, it, as you can see, it's pretty well spotless. They get new sand once a month. Um, the grass boxes they can access from the side. It, I think it all boils down to, I have stacked cages and I have a big pen and I also have ground breeding pens. So I have three different types of enclosures and I found they're happy in all of them. They're just as happy in my stacked cages as they are in the big pen, which surprises people. But I, I think it comes down to embellishment, um, company, food, water, and a sand bath. I've actually even had um, broody hens in the stack cages, which are white, which goes back to what I said about the, the white environment. That's all I got on, on that. I, I think it's really <laughs> just basic care. And no, they don't drown um, in the water. <laughs> they, don't drown, they don't drown in their pond. <laughs> no. You want me to go to the next photo? You'll have to maybe cover it for chicks, though. Yes, please, Terry, if we can yeah, have the next photo. That's what I'm worried about with the clucky hen. Right. Yeah. Um, so, um, just leading on to uh, from what Tamara said about uh, providing that clean and healthy environment, um, because we do want the healthy birds. So, um, Something that I see almost daily in the various online quail communities uh, is a lot of people saying that quail are dumb or quail are suicidal or that they lack the basic instincts to live or that they're difficult and fragile to raise. So um, I'm probably, I'll, pre I'll preface this. There is a lot of different ways you can raise quail. And Tamara said she's got three different setups from that big ground pen you saw in the photo 
two stacked cages and a few options in between those. So there are a lot of good ways to raise quail. Um, I'm probably going to sound a little bit harsh here though, um, but please just remember that I'm on your side of this. Uh, I want you to be the best quail breeder you can be and for you to produce the healthiest, most exquisite quail possible. Human error plays a huge part in quail injury and quail mortality. Sorry, but it just does need to be said. Um, these quail, when bred to a high standard and provided for properly, are actually really hardy creatures and quite adaptable to a wide range of environments. But when we participate in the haphazard multiplying of an animal, uh, when we assist hatches, when we fix splayed legs, when we force feed, uh, and when we breed inferior quail, we are doing the species a disservice. Also, when we humans keep an animal um, trapped, we're domesticating them and depriving uh, their natural wild instincts for generation after generation, it is our responsibility as keepers to keep them safe and to give them a good quality of life at every stage. And as I said, that can make, uh, take many forms. Stack cages, there's nothing wrong with them. Big open pens, there's nothing wrong with them. It's um, what suits you and your environment and what um, enables you to care for your quail safely and properly. Um, so chicks drowning is a really good example for this. Um, people say, you know, they, they, back, they lack the basic instincts to live because they drown in water uh, when they're chicks. So we need to remember they're brand new babies and they've just hatched and they have never known this world before. It is absolutely 100% the human's responsibility to provide water in such a manner that they cannot drown or get wet and die of hypothermia. We would not, I hope, um, blame a human child's intelligence or lack of life skills if they drowned in a backyard swimming pool. They are only a child and it is 100% the adult's responsibility to keep the child safe. Your quail that you keep in cages or aviaries cannot parent themselves. The human that chooses to breed and to keep them is 100% responsible for making sure that they have a safe and suitable environment to thrive in at every stage of their life. Um, let's take a sip. <laughs> I have lots of talking to get through. It's early. <laughs> um, yes, accidents do happen. Um, if you didn't know something or you forgot something or you were given inaccurate information, it might not be your fault, but it is still human error. It is not quail error. So I'll just let that digest for a moment. I may have put some noses out of joint. I'm sorry. We don't so, um, play legs or crooked toes or anything like that. Um, I I cull those babies as well. It does make a difference long term. I did do an experiment a few yeah. years ago where I kept them and did a three generational breeding of dodgy babies. And by the third generation, we were getting about fifty percent with problems. So uh, I can I can say for certain that it does make a difference. Don't breed with them. Mm. So yeah, I, it I does. agree. Um, so the the next thing that um, I'd like to address, which is exactly what Tamara said, basically, um, is a breeding question that get uh, that gets asked a lot. Uh, I see it, you know, every week in the quail groups. Uh, in breeding, so in breeding isn't normally an issue with quail or birds in general. In fact, line breeding of quail, um, and line breeding is a controlled form of inbreeding, is an integral part of most quality breeding programs. Most times, quality quail breeders do avoid that full brother-sister breedings uh, in favour for father-daughter, mother-son, uncle-niece, uh, grandmother, grandson, cousin-cousin, etc. breedings. 
But sometimes sibling breedings are necessary and no, they do not lead to issues when done correctly with quality stock. But haphazard breeding, where you keep everything that hatches, you don't cull appropriately, you keep big mixed flocks with no record keeping or poor record keeping, that type of breeding will generally bring out problems that people then claim are the result of inbreeding. So Tamara and I have both done extensive testing on this on these styles of breeding and our line bred lines where we haven't outcrossed them for you know sometimes dozens of generations is they are healthier than those mixed um, haphazard breedings that we do. So no matter what style of breeding a breeder does, they should always be culling inferior stock and excuse me, be keeping appropriate records so that they are able to trace any issues that may arise. There's quail breeders and there's quail multipliers. Avoid getting stock from those multipliers, those people who do those haphazard breedings and they don't cull for inferior stock. And don't become a multiplier yourself. A good quality breeder knows what they're doing, knows their bird's lineages, and will not breed inferior stock. If it is really, really darn cute. Just you don't breed it if it is not an ideal specimen. Or as close to a good rule is if you wouldn't pay fifty dollars for it, don't breed with it. Yeah, that's a good rule. When I when For I assess sure. a bird, I, I look at it and say, would I spend money on that bird or from yeah. offspring on offspring from that bird? And if the answer is no, then it's not breeding quality. Yeah, absolutely. That is a really good rule of thumb. I'm gonna I'm gonna use that and I think potentially I might have some extra culls that I definitely wouldn't pay fifty dollars for. You know what I mean, like if you wouldn't pay full price for it, then it, it probably shouldn't be in the program. Yeah. Um, so constantly introducing that um, unknown new blood into a flock risks bringing in various genetic faults, which may lay hidden, but still there. Um, so by appropriately line breeding, you bring out any recessive faults and cull them. And as you should know the lineage of all your quail by the good record keeping, record keeping method, you can then trace any of those faults or issues and cull appropriately, leaving only the genetically healthy animals. So line breeding guarantees genetic soundness when done correctly. It's Avoiding line breeding your quail it's important to note that a lot of traits in in everybody, including you and me, is they are poly, polygenic, which means you can't necessarily see them. They may be handed down through mm. multiple generations. Uh, and and if the more different lines you bring in, the more unknown traits you're bringing in, because there, so many of what affects your bird's health and quality can't actually be seen. Mm. Yeah, and it might be something that's been passed down for the previous 15 generations. And if you don't know where that quail has come from um, or you know the, any problems that have occurred with their siblings or whatever over those last 15 generations, then you're really at a really low starting point. Um, there might not be anything wrong with those quail, but you don't know. And that's, I think, the important thing is you don't know. So. Um, Avoiding line breeding your quail will avoid bringing out those recessive faults. But what you're left with may have a bunch of invisible faults, and that's those things that Tamara was talking about. They might not be specific single genes that cause a fault. They might be polygenic things that um, take several gene, a lot of genes to actually create that fault. Um, and you don't know about those. So those faults will always be there, hidden in the background and they can pop out at any time and you'll be oblivious to where they came from. Or 
on a positive note, they might actually not be faults at all. There are recessive colours and recessive positive traits too. Um, I know Tamara has discovered uh, a colour, a couple of colours that are recessive, that just popped up uh, out of nowhere. So that's a positive trait. Um, and I, but I the wouldn't best be able to, to experiment with them if I wasn't line breeding them. There's no way exactly, to, bring yeah. that, to bring that colour out because it's recessive. If I kept outcrossing, I'd never see it again. Mm, yeah, yeah. So you can lose those positive traits um, as well. So the, the best and most accurate way to bring out, identify and isolate recessive genes is by breeding to known stock, known stock to known stock. Uh, that's not to say that you should never introduce new blood, but you have to do that with the same degree of care as you take with line breeding. Basically, any method of breeding requires an understanding of what you are doing and care in carrying out those actions. You can also have your own separate um, lines. Back to. I, I have my ferro line. I've actually got two separate ferro lines, which I spiral breed and I never add anything to them. I just always have enough that I can breed them distantly. So they're, they're never... I mm. don't do sibling breedings with them. I, I cross back to aunties and uncles or, or distant relatives and I just keep that going. And I've had that line for eight years and they're phenomenal. I, I think they're one of my most admired lines, which is my my Yeah, pharaohs. they are. Yeah. 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 Oh, your pharaohs are just perfect. Um, so, yeah, you... Uh, yeah, you can create your own lines and that's where uh, like breeding lines, like the JMF line um, and like the some of those um, named sort of um, trademarked named lines come from. They're not a colour or whatever. They're a, uh, a bloodline and you can't achieve that. You can't achieve your own lines if you are constantly outcrossing. You do need generation after generation of the right, um, yeah, the right hen, uh, the right quail. Um, so how do we select the right breeders? Um, I think Tamara, would you like to talk about the first step as egg selection? Uh, I think the next picture is the egg, Katie. Oh yes, please, Terry. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I start my selection with egg shape. I try to make sure that they're appropriate for the bird size. Don't go nuts trying to breed hens that lay gigantic eggs. I, I don't know why people think that big birds should lay big eggs, but they need to lay an egg that is appropriate to their size or you will start getting prolapse hens and egg-bound hens. So. Pick a size and aim for it and like that double yoker there, you wouldn't incubate that uh, and people still do it. But don't do it because it's going to be two babies and they're probably going to die. Your goal is to give your birds the best opportunity to, to reach your long-term goals. So it, for me, it starts with egg selection. Um, most of mine are... 14 grams and I try to only set eggs that are 14 grams and it also looks very professional when you're posting eggs when they arrive and they're all you wouldn't be happy if you got a, a eggs in the mail and they look like the eggs on that hand there all over the place you you want them to be nice and neat hmm. Yeah, and a consistent um, shape as well. Odd shapes, like you know, too pointy or too round, uh, can indicate uh, issues with your hen. So uh, yeah, select right. a your, your bone, proper um, egg-shaped shape. Yeah. Uh, yeah, egg shape can also have to do with the the bone structure of a bird. Um, deformed keel bone, and these are things that you can't see. 
um, mm. a, again, unless you know what you're feeling for, you can actually feel the keel bone, which is the little sail bone that goes down the front of the bird to, and meets up just under the pelvis. And that, if that's deformed, it may actually affect not only the bird shape, but her egg shape as well. And she may be more likely to, to a, end up egg bound, lay double yokers, it, it, there's a whole host of issues that can come from confirmation issues, which we're going to talk about. Mm. Um, yeah. So yeah, and then she can does. pass those um, those poor, that poor shape onto her offspring as well. So yeah. you can use your eggs as an indication of uh, one of the indications of how healthy or structurally sound your hens are. Um, so, Terry, excuse can we move me. to the next photo, please, which is an incubator? Yeah. Uh, excuse me. Tamara, could you speak up just a little bit? We're getting a couple of people saying they can't really hear you. It's kind of muffled. Unfortunately, I think it's just my, my headset. I think I need to get a new one before I do this again. Okay. Sorry, guys. <laughs> That's all right. I can hear you fine. I don't, I mean, I've got head, I got uh, earbuds in, but okay. I do Go have ahead. a very strong Aussie accent, too, so that probably doesn't help. <laughs> <laughs> right, thanks, guys. Yeah, I got a few comments on my accent last time as well. <laughs> Sorry, people. <laughs> uh, so uh, the next... So, yeah, just like Tamara, my breeding quail selection starts uh, right at the big stage. But the next important factor in the process uh, goes back to environment and it's an artificial environment this time. But what we do with those eggs uh, is generally put them into an incubator. So your incubator or the method, whatever method you're using to hatch your eggs should have optimum development and hatching conditions. Any deviation from optimal can cause slow or rapid development in the chicks, which leads to early or late or staggered hatching physical effects, future growth rate abnormalities, and other long-term health issues that may or may not be visible. Uh, inconsistent or fluctuating incubation temperature, and that includes uh, having hot spots or cold spots within your incubator. Uh, sometimes corners and things are notorious for being hotter or colder than where the temperature probe is. So having those inconsistent or fluctuating temperatures are the biggest contributor to leg, hip and foot issues. Splayed legs seems to be really common in quail, but it's not normal. They're not predispositioned to having splayed legs. It generally, not always, but it generally does come from incubation temperatures and occasionally humidity as well. Also, chicks hatching early or late or a hatch lasting three or four or five days is not normal or healthy. I know that it's normal in the terms that that's what happens with most people, uh, when, with most incubators, but it's not normal as in normal development or healthy development for those chicks. Chicks should all pip and hatch on a very predictable timeline. And hatching is all done and over within about 36 hours, sometimes most often less than 24 hours. That's when you've got those ideal optimal conditions. 12 hours. Um, so, from first pip Sorry, what was that tomorrow? 12 hours for us, we average from the first pip to the last pick out, which means my incubator yeah. is spot on. That's, that's around about what you should be aiming for. Yeah, mine's about 24 hours. Um, so, uh, and after 24 hours, I do give them a couple more hours, but um, how that relates to the selective breeding that we're talking about today is if you've eliminated all those environmental causes for the early and late hatching, for the inconsistent growth, for splayed legs, the failure to thrive, and those unfortunately quite common issues, we will now know that if you do have those issues, they may be genetic or nutritional or something within the quail itself and something that you probably have to cull for. So we know that it's not the incubator causing those issues. So we're just basically eliminating variables. Uh, so 
you know, if Tamara's quail all hatch normally within 12 hours and, you know, one hatch, there's something that hatches a little bit earlier than predicted or there's something that hatches a bit later than predicted, then she's going to know that there's a potential issue with that line of quail. And it might just be that um, that particular line of quail does catch, hatch earlier or something, but it shouldn't be a significant variation. And I think what we're trying to do is eliminate variables. Um, so for me, uh, curled feet that don't correct themselves without help within 24 hours, that's a cull. Uh, splayed legs, cull. If it can't hatch by itself, it's cull. Now that's not to say I don't ever help chicks. That's just to say that they do not become part of my breeding program. Um, Failure to thrive, that's a cull. Rye neck, definitely a cull. Basically, anything except for the ideal should be marked or separated to make sure you know who they are and that they don't go into your breeding program. Tamara and I both use food dye on our chicks so that they can be brooded together, but they're marked and quite visible um, who's who and they're marked for different things. So food dye, food gel is a, is a good one. Um, so remember that cull doesn't always mean kill. It means to exclude from a breeding program. Sometimes that might mean that you should put them to sleep, but sometimes it means that they're perfectly fine for pets or eggs or meat. Both Tamara and I, and I think every breeder that I know, has some culls in their flock. They just don't breed from them. I have a few hens that are you know, they're my babies, they're my beloved pets. I've got far too many roosters just because they're really pretty, but they're not my breeding <laughs> stock. I use them for eggs or meat production. Um, so just don't allow those culls to breed. Um, then as your chicks grow, you need to look at general vitality. Uh, is the young quail alert? Are they strong? Are they active? Are they eating and drinking by themselves? And are they able to find the heat source without assistance? If you're having to constantly baby the quail and um, show them where the water is or show them where the food is or keeping putting them under the heat because they're straying away uh, and then not being able to find their way back, that sometimes it is a um, husbandry issue. Your brooder needs a different setup. But sometimes that can indicate that there's a bit of a lack of vitality in those quail. So just keep an eye on those things. So um, other issues to notice as your quail mature uh, can include things like scruffy feathers uh, that can indicate nutritional deficiencies or something metabolic. And sometimes nutritional deficiencies aren't something that's caused by what you're feeding the quail. It might be a metabolic thing within that specific quail, like that individual can't absorb a particular vitamin or mineral from the food. So they're acting differently to their brothers and sisters who have been fed the same food. Uh, so when we say nutritional, that's not necessarily telling you that you're feeding your quail incorrectly. That might just be they can't absorb those nutrients. Um, so another thing, being prone to getting poo balls on their toes when their hatchmates aren't uh, can mean that they have poor stance, uh, poor leg structure. Obviously, we're excluding husbandry issues here. If all of your quail are getting poo balls, that's a husbandry issue. But if it's one and there's no reason why, it could be a leg issue. Uh, things like, excuse me, um, long feet. beaks or long toenails. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Their, their feet are really important. Look at those, definitely. Um, and long beaks and long toenails can be a metabolic or nutritional thing. Or it could be that they're not able to groom themselves properly as well. So, yeah, that comes back to vitality um, and making sure your quail are the best that they possibly can be. Um, aggression is definitely a reason to cull, uh, and that is generally 99% of the time um, a put to sleep situation. We don't breed aggression into our quail. Remember, we want our breeding stock to be the healthiest strongest and most optimal that it can be and we don't deviate from that um, 
So, uh, Terry, can we have the next photo, please? And Tamara will go over um, the physical confirmation and body structure that we're looking for in adult quail. Yes. Uh, uh, as a lot of people know, we're, we've started the uh, Australian show scene and William has started the online world show. Um, so as a judge, and as a breeder, this is what I look for, the points on the screen. I actually can't read them because my image is up there. Um, Terry, are we able to move our images over um, to the other side or somewhere different? Well, yeah, there, so guess. Tamara can read. Yeah. <laughs> cool. <laughs> uh, Thank yeah. you. So <laughs> when, when I assess a breeder, I try to have them alert, to so hold a mealworm or some lettuce up in front of them so that they stand up. You know, a lot of these fat birds just won't stand up straight. I actually cull those. If they can't stand up and look like this, I don't keep them. And that's including mm. the jumbos. Uh, I know that sounds really harsh, but they are a natural ground dwelling bird. They need good legs. They need to be able to be alert and run around. Uh, it, it really does matter. If your bird looks like this, when it's standing up straight, you've got a good bird. Um, maybe we could put that in the comments when we, so that people can save it um, when we're done here, because uh, it, it is worth assessing your bird based on something like this, and that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're breeding jumbos or or colour or bantams. The the general confirmation should be something like this. Mm. Uh, can we have the next picture? Yeah, and the confirmation is more important than the colour. So you start yes, by I, I selecting a foremost. structurally good bird. Yep, first and foremost on confirmation, even in my colour lines. Mm. So this, this is just showing certain, I've uh, put their keel bone there in yellow. <laughs> Roach brack is a really common one. Uh, I see it a, a lot when they're standing up straight. They shouldn't have a big curve in their back. If you have a feel of birds that look like that, you'll actually feel that their bone that's their bones that you're seeing that are curved. And that is a, is a confirmation fault and that's one of the things that will lead to ongoing problems, especially in babies, egg laying. Tell them, don't try to breed with them just because they're your favourite. Mm. I think that pretty much covers that. Um, we'll try to get them up so that people can actually save them when we're done here. Yeah, we'll um, we'll both post those images on our Facebook pages today so that uh, you can look at them properly and study them, print them out, and I, I can and put them on the. Uh, yeah. I can put them in the comments. Uh, a link to a PDF mm. where they can download them. Oh, that'd be great. Thanks, Terry. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Um, so if we can have the next photo, please, Terry. And uh, we can probably put our little faces back to where they were. Yeah. <laughs> so um, now comes the more subjective selection criteria. So what Tamara was just talking about should apply to all quail, no matter their purpose, uh, and no matter what you personally like, what, those were structural issues that are healthy, structurally sound quail. So now comes the more subjective selection criteria. Um, and these are the, the questions that you need to ask yourself when you're looking at what you want to breed. Are you breeding for size? Are you breeding for colours? Are you breeding the mass market? Are you a boutique breeder? What do you personally like? Is there a niche in your local market that you can fill? So here we've got an example of two three week old Italian colored roosters. Uh, these are a couple of my current babies. So they come from the same breeding group. They've got the same father. They uh, may or may not have the same mother. They are roughly the same weight and size. They are both healthy and they look very similar. 
but I have already tagged the one on the right as a potential future breeder at only three weeks old. The one on the left will be sold or become food for our family. So he is in my cull line. The one on the right that I'm keeping has rounder eyes rather than that almond-shaped eye. And um, sometimes that, if you're taking photos, sometimes they will just squint and it looks um, and it looks rounder or more almond shape in the photo. But uh, these two I've watched over the past few weeks and I know that one has a rounder eye than the other. So you do need to look at your birds and study them uh, long term. It's not something that you can necessarily quickly just look at. Um, but the, sorry, um, the one on the right has, a more defined lines on his face mask, so the, the three lines that are coming down from his ear. And I'm currently reading for colour and markings, and I am trying to get my face face masks more defined and uh, more perfect. Um, so although he still has some growing to do, he's looking like a really good candidate to replace his father in the future. So just because I've selected him at three weeks old as a potential breeder doesn't mean I'm necessarily going to keep him. I'm going to reassess that um, at six weeks old uh, when I do my next uh, round of cull and then I will also um, assess that at you know butcher time or whenever um, maybe you know 12 weeks or before I put him in the breeding pen. Um, so selection is an ongoing thing and when I get a better rooster than him I'll replace him. So just because he's a good breeder now, or you've got a really good, beautiful breeder now, doesn't mean that they have to be your breeder forever. Um, so now if I was breeding for meat alone, then I probably would have chosen the one on the left instead. The differences are minimal, but he is a few grams heavier at three weeks old, and he has matured just slightly faster. So um, at, at three weeks old, it is hard to tell, but those are the qualities that we'd be choosing for meat production if we were doing meat production alone and not looking at colour at all. So, um, another factor that can heavily influence which quail you ultimately select as your breeders is what you're actually trying to achieve. So if you're breeding for colour, for example, this is where an understanding of pluming, uh, plumage genetics can come in. Not every colour breeds true. And there's lots of really nice mixes too. And you can create um, you know, a line of birds that breeds true that is your own mix um, and your own bloodline. So, but you need to start off with uh, you know, the basic ingredients. So sometimes your starting point might not look anything like what your end goal is. So uh, this little guy on the right is actually potentially going to be part of my Oz Snowy Manchurian project next year. Next year, So that's still several months away, but I'm already making those selections now. Even though he's not a Manchurian and he's not a carrier for Oz Snowy, that's what project I need a clean Italian rooster for um, to start that project. Uh, so on that note, I think Tamara should talk about goal setting. Uh, she's really good at this and how breeders can go about planning and then achieving those goals. So, um, Mary, can we have the next photo, please? Yeah, so goal setting is a tough one. Only you know where you want to be. But it boils down to where are you now? Where do you want to be? And how are you going to get there? Uh, you might have to research for a long time and you may have to be extraordinarily selective. Um, I'm going to use my Rosettas and Tibetans as an example. I only started with them last year. Um, I've only had them for right on a year. And my very first one was fawn enhanced. It had dotted white and it had sexless brown. So it had all the bad stuff that I didn't want. Uh, so I set my goal, which, and I had no choice but to use him because I am very rural. And it's hard for me to get hold of new birds. It was hard to get mm. the eggs here. I had to get a permit. I had to wait six months for my permit to arrive. And then the first eggs that arrived didn't hatch, so I had to do it all again. It was a very, very long process. So I had to work with what I had, which was not a very nice bird. 
so I bred him to my pharaohs, my pharaoh hens, which we're going to have pictures of, of soon. And then I selected as many as I could that didn't have fawn and dotted white. There was only, I think, two. So I had to breed again. Uh, I think all up I hatched about 80 chicks from the one rooster over multiple pharaoh hens before I finally had a handful of birds that didn't have fawn and dotted white. And then I did it again. So, and then I did it again. I ended up doing it five times until I ended up with these birds. Um, because sex link brown can be carried along. Uh, it needs to be more than one generation. And I know there's a lot of people currently working on getting rid of sex link brown. So I would recommend at least five generations of crossing back to pharaoh. And I know that's frustrating when you want something in homozygous, where like I wanted Tibetan, mm. but I had to have rosettas for five generations before I could get there. Otherwise, that bird on the right wouldn't look like that. So, uh, yeah, and it, it doesn't matter what you're doing. Be selective for multiple generations, or, always. But when you're reaching your goal, be super, super selective and don't expect to only pump out five or six chicks. You're going to need a lot to do something like this. If you're getting rid of multiple issues from only a limited amount of original birds, you are going to have to breed in big numbers and be ex extremely selective and you will reach mm. your goal. Uh, next picture, please. Yeah, please. Um, and we had a, we had a question from um, a an Australian um, school girl who follows us and she can't watch today because she's at school because it's school time in Australia. Uh, and she asked how many generations does it take to breed a colour line? Forever. And um, so Tamara has just answered that, that it is um, very variable. Sometimes it's only a couple of generations, but Tamara has been refining those um, EBs, those extended browns, uh, rosettas and Tibetans for such a long time uh, and multiple upon multiple generations. So, and over the time it's it's been hundreds of chicks. So, um, and I just love what Tamara's done with her rosettas and her Tibetans. They are just exquisite uh, and hopefully I'll be at that point soon, fingers crossed. Um, but in my photos here, uh, I have uh, an Italian hen. So the fawn gene mutation is responsible for creating what we call Italians when it's in heterozygous. That's one copy of the fawn gene. And it creates a Manchurian when it's homozygous. So that is two copies of that fawn gene. So this is just uh, part of one of my ongoing goals, which is to clean up and separate every color mutation so that I have the basic ingredients to make whatever I want in the future. And just like when you're baking, the quality and purity of your ingredients makes a difference to the final product. So fawn or Italian and Manchurian is very common and I use it in a lot of my other colour breedings as a, as a book to put dilutes on and such. So I want my Italians to be the absolute best version of Italian that there is. So later on, when I breed my fantastic looking, clean, crisp Italians together, I'll get the best, most clean Manchurians possible. So in a similar way to Tamara with her EBs that she's just explained, we start by cleaning up the heterozygous version, which in Tamara's case, that was the Rosetta. In my case, it's Italian. Um, and only when that is perfect, and that may take two, 10 generations, whatever. It, it takes a lot of generations generally. Um, probably I'd say average five, I don't know. Do you think maybe five generations to clean up a yeah, heterozygous yeah, color, so do you reckon tomorrow? Get rid of brown, you want to do four or five generations minimum and then give it a go. And if you get any of the clean brown, try again, back to zero. Yeah, yeah. So um, later on, I will be going over uh, how to get rid of sex link brown in detail. So stick around for that. Um, but yeah, so it's only when we've got that perfect heterozygous 
version of mutation, then we can breed it to create that homozygous version. So in Tamara's case, that was the Tibetans. She had to stick with Rosetta for however many generations before he bred them together to get the Tibetan. And so this hen here um, is one of mine that I consider to be the ideal Italian phenotype. Um, this is what I aimed for and have now achieved. And so she's almost ready to breed another Italian and then I will get my perfect Manchurians. So uh, she has a crisp black mask with three solid lines extending from her ear. She's got the black smile line extending from her beak. Her eyes are round rather than almond shape. Uh, the colour and patterning on her back is crisp and uniform. I'm now ready to breed her with her son, which is actually the chick from uh, a couple of photos ago, provided that he grows out to be as good looking as I think he will. If not, I will breed her back to a clean farrow to get some more Italians and hope that one of those is an ideal rooster. So I am ready to breed her, but I haven't got an ideal partner for her. So that's what I'm working on now. So now in a few months, hopefully, uh, when I have those perfectly clean Manchurians with the ideal pattern, the ideal color and no known recessive mutations, I can actually then use them to test other things because I can guarantee that 100% of their offspring will be Manchurian or Italian. And I can then use them, they, I know they're clean, and clean means that though you don't have stray random genes um, as far as what we can possibly know. So I can then use those Manchurians to clean other color lines. So I started with a genetic soup just like Tamara did, and which is what most people start with. Uh, realistically, that's what most people breed, is a genetic soup of randomness. So all of my fawns had sex-linked brown and or dotted white. I believe my original hen actually had recessive white. And as it turns out, some of my originals also were Oz Snowy Carriers, which is another recessive mutation. And I wouldn't have found that without the line breeding of them. So, I've been able to bring out and eliminate these things by line breeding, by selectively breeding, by keeping accurate records, by hard culling anything that does not fit the, or that is not working towards the ideal phenotype. Phenotype is um, visual appearance, the look. So, um, and by breeding back to Pharaoh. So, um, Terry, can we have the next photo, please? And we'll move on to some examples of what we call test breeding. And Tamara and I have done a lot of this. <laughs> uh, so this is, uh, so test breeding is what we use when we don't necessarily know what a specific gene, gene mutation quail has. Sometimes we have a quail that has several colours mixed and we're unsure exactly what or which they are because when colours mix, sometimes their phenotype changes and we don't necessarily see what we're looking for. Um, so we would do a test breed to kind of separate out and isolate the individual components or colours. It's kind of uh, reverse engineering so we do know the modes of inheritance for the vast majority of currently named gene mutations. Mode of inheritance is how a mutation is passed on to the next generation. The modes of inheritance that we commonly deal with in quail are incomplete dominant, recessive and co-dominant. And most of those are autosomosal, which is, means it doesn't involve the sex zones, male and a sex male and female in the same way, um, and a few are sex linked, and we'll go into what that is later as well. So, um, and we have a good understanding already uh, of what the homozygous and the heterozygous phenotypes are for most 
known colours. So we're at a point in quail breeding in general where we have got a lot of the information. We are just sort of trying to collate it and work out how it all fits together. So we know with reasonable accuracy what results we are supposed to get when we cross certain colours. So when test breeding, we're often comparing our actual results to see if they match what we already know to be true. Um, so this photo here, uh, this is an example of when I've used test breeding to figure out what colour a quail is. So in this photo, uh, here on the right, we have two blue fawn roosters. Now I know they're blue and I know they're fawn. But, uh, so they're the ones on the left and on the right we have a bunch of their offspring. So uh, the blue dilute gene mutation can be a bit tricky when it's on fawn because blue does significantly change the colour and the degree of visible patterning. So we can't necessarily see what base colour a quail is. So I know these two roosters are fawn. And remember, um, fawn is Italian uh, and Manchurian. So what I can see, well, sorry, what I can't see is if they are Italian based, which is heterozygous fawn, or if they are Manchurian based, which is homozygous fawn. And that does then affect my breeding results. So I do need to know if they are heterozygous or homozygous for that fawn gene. What we do know is that Manchurian when bred with Italian, will produce only Manchurian and Italian offspring. We also know that Manchurian with Farrow will produce 100% Italian offspring. So Manchurian crossed with Italian uh, and or Farrow will not produce any Farrow offspring. I hope I'm not talking too fast for everyone to understand my Aussie accent here. Um, so uh, on the other hand, if we breed Italian with Italian, we will end up with Farrow, Italian and Manchurian offspring. So those three colours. And if we breed Italian with Farrow, we will end up with Italian and Farrow offspring. So the difference between those two scenarios is that Manchurian cannot produce any pharaoh offspring, but Italian can produce pharaoh offspring. So to find out if my roosters here on the left are Manchurian or Italian based, I put each of them with an Italian hen, a sparkly Italian hen and a sparkly pharaoh hen. Uh, you can ignore, ignore the sparkly component in this scenario, it doesn't actually impact the results. I just wanted to breed blue sparkles. So. Uh, Anyway, so I've got two Italians and a farrow hen with each of these uh, male uh, quail here. So if these breedings produce uh, any farrow offspring, now we know they are certainly Italian based. Or if they produce no farrow offspring, then my test hatch, uh, and if my test hatch uh, was ample size, I will know that they are Manchurian based. So I did two good sized test hatches with both of these roosters. Marmalade is the one on the top left and he turned out to be a Manchurian based. So he's a blue Manchurian, which is homozygous fawn plus heterozygous blue. He did not produce any farrow chicks. And I did two good sized breedings with him uh, and I have bred him since. So um, that has proved true that he does not uh, breed, a, uh, sorry, farrow offspring at all. So Custard's brother is the one in the bottom left. He did produce a handful of farrow offspring, which means he is an Italian based. So he's a blue Italian, which is heterozygous fawn and homozygous blue. I also found out during this test that he is a carrier for the uh, recessive or snowing gene and that was a bit of a surprise but now I know and now I can confidently use each of these roosters in other projects and get 
predictable results. Um, yep, Tamara, would you like to give another example of test breeding while I catch my breath? I think, Terry, have, uh, can we put up the next photo of the white birds, please? Uh, yeah, um, this is my example of test breeding. I have had Splash for nearly eight years. However, I didn't know that until 2019. Um, I kept putting, I didn't have, own a single tuxedo until uh, last year. Um, I kept putting my white birds with solid colored birds in hopes of getting a tuxedo and it never happened. Um, now, when you breed homozygous dotted white to a solid bird, you should get a hundred percent tuxedo, and that wasn't happening. Mm. So I continued. It, it, I was very confused because splash wasn't known in Japanese quail. It, it was something that was in, um, I think it's button. It's it's totally new, and um, I just wasn't getting the results that I was expecting. I was getting very frustrated that I couldn't create a tuxedo. So we ended up going back to basics and crossing back to Pharaoh because I'd already introduced Sandy and Fawn. And uh, that's how we learnt that it was its own thing. So we crossed to Clean Pharaoh and we started getting birds like Moo there, who is on the left the lovely pharaoh and then we started crossing them back to pharaoh and we got half and half so we got half like that and half solid birds and none of the solid birds had any white chins or white flight feathers um, so that's how we figured out that it wasn't dotted white and then to figure out whether uh, both phenotypes homozygous and heterozygous we then bred these guys together and we discovered that um, it was autosomal incomplete dominant. So we've got the homozygous phenotype on the right bottom there, and the other two are hetero. So it, I couldn't have done that without breeding back to Pharaoh. I could never have figured that out without test breeding. So especially for color breeders, I think that it's very it's valuable to have Pharaohs on hold and um, utilize them whenever you're unsure. Hmm. Uh, Tamar, how many uh, generations did it take you to work out that Splash was its own mutation, that it wasn't just dotted white? Well, before I started testing them, I already had my suspicions because I wasn't specifically breeding with them. I actually didn't really like them. Because I, I guess because I was associating that frustration with these darn white birds that I, that I couldn't get tuxedo. Um, so after I got stuck into it and started test breeding, I think it was only three generations um, and I was getting consistent, 100% consistency. Um, and now I've got them down pat. I've produced, uh, I think, mm. 900 splash birds in the past 12 months. Most That's a lot. Them, yeah, yeah, yeah. I went kind of nuts with it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I think they're one of my favourites. Uh, and my five year old daughter, Pollyanna, wants everybody to know that she named Splash. Oh, congratulations, Pollyanna. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she named them. <laughs> uh, so, Terry, can we have the next image, please? Tamara, are you going to explain what this one is, what this means? Yeah, pretty much what we just said. If you can't narrow it, if you don't know what it is, breed to pharaoh. If you're trying to get rid of mm. something you don't want, breed to pharaoh. Um, this is for plumage mutations, obviously. If you're breeding jumbos or phantoms, and you don't care what colour they are, just forget about all this. It, there's no right or wrong. This is specifically mm. for people who want to perfect a colour. You, If you want to breed colour, you need zero. You're going to need it. Yeah. Um, so 
when we talk about the statistics of what colour offspring you'll get, um, that's listed on the left hand side of the screen there. So uh, we need to keep in mind that those are statistics for individual eggs and not whole hatches. So it's a bit like a coin toss uh, in that every toss of the coin is independent from each other and not influenced by the toss before or after. So if you throw a heads, it doesn't mean that you will get tails next. Uh, out of 100 throws of the coin, statistically, you should expect about 50 heads and about 50 tails, but you could also get 100 heads and zero tails or anything in between. So each egg laid has the same odds as the one before and the one after. There is absolutely no way to know exactly how many chicks of each colour you will get. We do know that the statistics for mode of inheritance, they are mathematically true. So what I've got here on the left hand side of the screen is, uh, so the second one down, Farrow cross Italian. You should get roughly 50% Farrow and 50% Italian, but you may not. So these statistics um, don't stop your hen from laying six rosettas in a row instead of three rosettas and three Tibetans like the, uh, like the chart says she should. So then you've got to take into account also that some eggs may be infertile and some might not develop or stop somewhere along the way. So when you're test breeding, you need to do a decent size hatch and you might have to do more than one hatch. And often it's more than one hatch, especially if you're working with only you know, one, two or three hens to start with. That's, you, know, you can only collect the eggs for seven to 10 days before they start losing viability. Uh, and so you need to do um, a minimum of about 30 chicks and that should yield some useful results for most simple projects. More complicated projects might require hundreds of chicks over several generations. Uh, you also need to get into the habit of opening all of your unhatched eggs after an incubation. Now, I know some people find that really gross, but you do need to include those in your record keeping. You need to note which parents they were from, if you know, and at what stage they died, if they have any physical deformities, uh, what colour they were, especially if you're colour breeding, and anything else that's important to your particular project. So now we know what test breeding is and how important farrows, particularly clean farrows are to many colour projects or many projects in general, but specifically colour projects. But what does a clean farrow look like? What should we be aiming for? And what is the ideal farrow phenotype? So Tamara has, without a doubt, the cleanest, most perfect farrows that I have ever seen and that most people have ever seen. So um, I've got a handful of young clean farrow hens and one gorgeous rooster, but Tamara has had clean quail since before I even had any quail. So I'm going to pass it over to her to tell you what the ideal farrow should look like. Can we have the next photos please, Terry? There they are. So wild type is basically the absence of all mutation. So when we say clean pharaoh, we're saying that all they are is wild type. They actually don't have any mutations, plumage mutations they're referring to. So they should have, what you like might vary. I selectively breed for the straight striations up the back. You can see that they're all in a pretty dead straight line. Um, you'll see a lot that don't have sexes brown. They are clean, but they don't look like this. That's purely just selection. Um, they, they're a tan and slate bird, which uh, if you've never seen a clean pharaoh before, you might think they're actually red and brown and they're not. Um, so this is what I use to clean up and test breed. Uh, this is what I use to get rid of the sexlink brown, the dotted white and the fawn from the extended browns. And this is what I use to figure out splash, figure out blue, pretty much 
everything I revert back to these guys and they've never let me down in nearly eight years. It's just a brilliant line. I feel very lucky to have them. But you've put a lot of hard work into achieving that. They didn't just happen. It, you know, you had to actually work hard for it. So yeah, I yeah, think I've got, I've you know, it, it, sho it shows in them how hard you worked to achieve that. Yeah, because I, I'm not just collecting for the stripes. I'm collecting for a certain shape as well that alerts um, long, strong legs, nice shape. I, these, these poor guys are assessed on everything from the moment they hatch to end up with a whole mm. line that look, all of them look like this. I, I cannot stress enough how you can't be too selective. And basically when I hatch these guys, 100% of them look exactly like this. And that's, that's exactly what I think everybody wants when they're aiming for a particular mm. phenotype or a particular type of bird. I, yeah, they, these guys go through a lot of critiquing. Mm. It's that predictability, isn't it? So when you're colour yeah. breeding, you want those predictable results. There is merit in sticking a whole heap of things together and just seeing what pops out because those can be awesome looking as well. But especially when you've got a customer who says, I want this, this and this and only that, you need to be able to deliver on that. And it is also, I think, really satisfying when you have a hatch and you, you thought you knew what it would look like and it does look exactly like you thought it was. There's no random things popping out. I find that really satisfying that yeah. I can now predict what I'm going to hatch at any given time. Is there another photo of these birds? Yeah. Not yet. Yeah, they're beautiful. So I, I, there's not really much more I can say about them. I'm I've, I've just so lucky to have these birds. <laughs> <laughs> not luck, hard work. Uh, I, ju so, I just want to inject um, a quick question. To, uh, yeah. Tamara, can you explain real quick um, what people should look for uh, if they're trying to clean up the ferro line? Uh, the, the main problem with most of the ferros, I think 99% of ferros on this planet have sex ring brown. Once you clean that up, you should eliminate mm. the red faces. Uh, most people will be looking at these and going, Mine don't look anything like that. Why do mine have red heads? Um, you can't get mm. this clean, crisp barring and these nice cream chests on the hands and the slate colour until you get rid of sex with brown. So if people want this, that is the first step they should take. When your birds come out like this, it might be four or five generations down the line, that's when you've you've done it. And unfortunately, mm. if you don't have clean ferro to begin with, cleaning up your ferros is going to be a challenge because you need a bird <laughs> without sex link brown to begin with. You can't get rid of it if they've already got it. Um, but that doesn't mm. mean you have to use Yeah, ferro. I'll go over the specifics of the... Yeah. I'll go over the little roadmap of how to exactly do that um, in a oh. moment. I have no yeah. idea how you would get rid of it if... if, if Every bird on your property has sex and brown. <laughs> well, you you can't, but I've um I've mapped out a few options that are potential ways. So, um, but yeah, if every bird's got it, yep, you got to get new birds. Um, so I just want to um point out that these aren't um just some random arbitrary standards that we've made up to suit what our personal quail look like. So. These, you know, beautiful, um, you know, the three crisp lines coming from the ear, that white uh, crisp collar on the roosters and the um, just the just whole look of them, where the lines should be and everything. Uh, it's not something we just made up. So in Germany, they do actually have official show standards for quail and those show standards do have a lot of specific detail and align with all of the physical traits that Tamara has just pointed out and that what Tamara's birds have. So 
we've also looked at the wild Catornix of different species, including the Japanese quail, which is Catornix japonica, uh, which is the primary base or ingredient uh, in this domestic species that we all keep. We've also looked at the European quail, which is Catornix catornix, the harlequin quail, Catornix delagore, um, and the rain quail, Catornix, I'm going to get this wrong, Catornix cora mandelica, uh, the rain quail, uh, and the Australian stubble quail, which is Catornix pectoralis. And these are the species that make up our modern day, current, domestic and commercial Catornix which is called Catornix japonica domestica, the domestic Japanese quail. Anyway, all of that is to say, yes, this is what Faro should look like. And no, we didn't just make it up. So uh, if you look at all of those wild species, oh, they have those crisp face masks uh, and these same markings. I mean, similar, not exactly the same, but similar markings. So when you combine all those, you're looking for those crisp, nice traits. So all of these clean traits of the farro colour are what naturally occurs when you eliminate all of those other gene mutations. Um, and as Tamara said, the farro is the absence of all mutations. So these guys on the screen now don't have any other mutations. They don't have any recessives that Tamara has discovered and over hundreds and hundreds of birds and lion breeding, she would have discovered those if uh, they did have them. And they don't have any, um, any incomplete dominant uh, markings either. So now to make things a little bit tricky, a lot of the time we do also use the name Pharaoh to describe all of the similar looking phenotypes. So for example, we might say a blue Pharaoh um, to describe a quail with the farrow looking pattern that has been diluted with the blue mutation. Genetically, that bird is no longer a farrow because it has a mutation. But we're using that name to describe a phenotype, so that's the look of the quail, not the genotype, which is what, the, what genetically it is. So, oh, excuse me. Um, so, um, anyway, Terry, can we have the... Next, I think final photo, and I hope that everyone's still with us. I know this has been going on a while, on um, a bit longer than normal, but um, this is the bit that I think everyone wants to know about, the nitty gritty of how you actually achieve a clean farrow. Now I will put this up, um, I will, so you don't have to take notes if you don't want to, I will put this up on all the different accounts so you can have this roadmap to work out what the heck you're doing. So we've mentioned sex link around here. Um, I'll try and say. So here what we're looking at, uh, we have two pretty good looking farrow roosters. The one on the left is homozygous for sex link brown. So he's not pure farrow. The one on the right is my boy Jujube and he is clean. So Sex link brown is the most common contaminant of all colours. It is subtle, it is often missed, or it's just completely overlooked because it is so common that a lot of breeders think that it is just normal colouring. In the US, at most places in the world, but particularly the US, it is definitely what you would all know as normal farrow. So here we've got a side-by-side -side comparison. Uh, can you see the extra brown in the face of the one on the left? So the, if you look at the cheeks, the cheeks of the one on the right are almost a pale pinky salmon color, whereas the left is more of a rusty brown. Then if you notice the mask or well, the chin straps on the left quail of, um, are brown, Whereas the right, sorry, the right quail are almost black. The clean quail has, has, that has a crisp white chin strap, um, whereas the sex link brown doesn't have that same crispness in general. He's a good looking bird, but 
he, you can see he doesn't have that same crispness. So sex link brown also changes the overall body and color slightly. It can add a brown looking collar and sometimes um, a big brown X or V on the back. Brown that extends past like the shoulder blades on the back, that's a really big indicator. Roosters can also have really brown or rusty coloured heads, that's those red heads or the brown heads, where the mask doesn't even show because the whole head is almost one colour. And sex link brown affects all quail, all plumage colours, not just farrow. But we're talking specifically about farrow because we need that to clean up the other colours. So the issue with sex link brown is one, that it is so common, and two, that it can be can really muddy the appearance of other colours if you're doing specific projects and wanting specific results. But if you like this colour, this sex link brown colour, and you don't necessarily want to do precise colour projects, then keep it and use it. It's a colour just like any other colour. It's just something you need to eliminate if you are going into colour breeding or if you want that crisp, clean farrow phenotype. As Tamara mentioned earlier, once you get rid of the sex link brown, that's when all that crispness comes out that we see in the bird on the right. So we have referred to clean farrow lots today and I know a lot of people want to know how to clean up their farrows and eliminate the sex link brown so that you can just dive into your colour projects and get the results you want. It does take time though. So sex link brown is a recessive sex linked colour mutation. It is sex linked because it can only affect the Z chromosome. So the, sorry, okay, in Australia, we say Z, in America, you say Z. So when I say Z, think Z, okay. So um, uh, I had trouble with that spelling my surname, which used to start with my maiden name, the Z. And so when I used to spell it, when I went to on a trip to Hawaii, when I was checking in places and stuff, they looked at me like, Z, what's Z? <laughs> so anyway, so, um, so sex link brown is, it only affects the Z sex chromosome. Quail roosters are ZZ and quail hens are ZW. Um, in humans, we've got X and Y chromosomes. So, you anyway, know, that means that hens can only have one copy of the sex link brown gene because they only have one Z chromosome. Um, they either have it or they don't. And that's the good news. So, uh, hens cannot carry it in a hidden form. Roosters, on the other hand, can have either one or two copies of sex link brown. They need two copies, uh, which is homozygous, of it to express that phenotype, that brown look. But if they only have one copy, uh, which is heterozygous, they are carriers. You can't see it, but it is there to be passed on to his offspring. So if you have a rooster that looks sex link brown, then he has two copies. He is homozygous. So he will pass on that one, co uh, one copy of sex link brown to 100% of his offspring. So if you, so that rooster on the left there, that is homozygous to sex link brown. If you want to eliminate sex, bring, sex link brown, you don't use him. So, well, he can, hang on, I'll get to that. But we theoretically don't want to use him. So he will pass on one copy to 100% of his offspring. If he doesn't look sex link brown, then he either doesn't have it, so can't pass it on, or he is heterozygous, so has one copy, and he will pass it on to about 50% of his offspring. A hen who looks sex link brown will pass it on to about 50% of her offspring some of which will be roosters, most likely. So um, when, so then they'll be hidden carriers. So keep that in mind. If she doesn't look sex link brown, then she doesn't have it, so can't pass it on. So the key to eliminating sex link brown is to find or create a rooster that doesn't look 
sex link brown. Then you've at least got the chance he's clean or that he is heterozygous. So we'll pass it on to only 50% of his offspring. So we've already talked about how uh, and why we use Farrow to clean up your colour lines and what an ideal Farrow should look like. But how do we achieve that clean Farrow if our flock is plagued with sex link brown? Um, or the Rue dilute. Remember that Rue is also a sex link recessive. So it breeds the same way as sex link brown. So that is another colour that you do want to get rid of for colour breeding. It's just a bit easier to see. So we don't necessarily, we can, we can see them easier um, and notice that they're different to Farrow. So if you don't have a single Farrow that doesn't look like it has sex link brown, please go ahead and check all of your other colours. If the only non-sex link, sorry, non-sex link brown quail that you have is an Italian, a Manchurian, a Rosetta or a Tibetan, go ahead and use them for this project. Even if you've got a tux and you know that the base colour looks clean, use it. It's not ideal, but it's much easier to breed out the dotted white later on after you've eliminated the sex link brown because um, dotted white is uh, an incomplete dominant, so it doesn't hide. There are other genes that are recessive and hidden, but you know, those are the one, the main ones that we're working with um, in, that are seen to be plaguing all quail populations. So if our roosters and our hens display sex link brown, then 100% of their offspring will also be sex link brown. Sorry, Sorry Katie, about I, that. Can I step in um, for a second? I've just got to sneak yeah. away for a minute and deal with my children. I can hear them <laughs> uh, harassing their dad out there. I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. You've already cleaned up your pharaohs, so you don't need to know this. <laughs> um, so if all of your... Um, quail have sex link brown, or look sex link brown, sorry, um, there really is nowhere you can go from here with that stock. So at minimum, you need a clean hen or a heterozygous rooster. So let's work on creating those, or let's work on creating a heterozygous rooster. So let's say we find um, a clean hen in our flock or, you know, somewhere. We, can't, we have a, a non-brown hen. It's a long road, but we can absolutely use her. So if our roosters display sex link brown and our hen is clean, all of their offspring will be sex link brown and all of their rooster offspring, sorry, all of their hen offspring will be sex link brown. They will look brown. And all of their rooster offspring will be sex link brown carriers. So remember, you won't be able to visually see the sex link brown phenotype in those carrier roosters. But trust the maths on this, 100% of them will be carriers. So mark them with leg bands or however you mark your quail, um, but they are carriers. So now we have our carrier rooster and we've got their mother who is clean. Um, we're going to be using their mother a lot. So let's give her a name. Um, Jane, plain Jane. She doesn't have anything else. So Jane. So mother rooster, sorry, mother hen that we used originally is Jane. So we need to pick our best rooster and breed him back to his mother Jane. So half of the offspring hens will be sex link brown, but half of them will be clean. Yippee. Um, so half of the offspring roosters will be sex link brown carriers and half of them will be clean. The really tricky part here is we won't be able to visually tell which are the clean roosters because they will look most likely, they will look exactly the same as their carrier brothers. So this is where our test breeding comes into play. Um, and you may need to do this a lot of times. So we need to test them, those roosters, one by one until we find one that is clean. 
That is, it produces 100% clean offspring. So we're going to take our original clean hen, Jane, and we're going to select her best looking grandson to breed with her. We can put Jane's clean hen grandchildren with her also so that we have more hens. That's just a bit easier to work with. But that does mean we are also doing a full sibling cross, which is not necessarily bad. It can be a good way to bring out anything that needs to be brought out, um, or it can provide, uh, sorry, prove that we've got good genetically healthy stock. So um, if the rooster we've selected is a sex link brown carrier, the offspring will be the same as what we got last time. About half of our hens will be sex link brown, which also means that we've got a mix of carrier and roost, uh, carrier roosters and clean roosters. So if this happens, if you get any of those brown hens, get rid of Jane's grandson that you just used to breed and move on to testing the next rooster. However, if Jane's grandson uh, rooster is clean, the one that you just bred with, hallelujah, 100% of your offspring will be clean. But remember the coin toss analogy I spoke about before. There is a possibility that our identified clean rooster isn't actually clean, but by random chance, we just didn't get any sex link brown offspring this time. So you need to test that rooster again and again. So I would test him because sex link brown is one of those really tricky ones. I would probably test him another three times with different hens just to make sure. Uh, yeah, I and, and then that way you're also building up a base of nice clean farrows and everyone wants clean farrows. Well, they should want clean farrows. Um, so that is the full instructions or the roadmap um, on how to eliminate sex link brown um, or the rue dilute. Uh, if you are starting out with just one clean hen and no clean roosters. If you are starting out the other way around and you've got a clean looking rooster and a sex link brown hen, then the process is similar, but you are going to be looking for different results along the way. So um, I think that this has probably been a lot to digest today. Um, we've gone um, longer than what we normally do. So I think I might just uh, finish up here and I'll put all of this and the next steps um, if you have got that clean rooster but not no clean hens. I'll put those into a document um, in the very near future. May not be today, but very soon. Um, and I'll post the link in the comments here and give it to Terry and we'll distribute that around so that you can all try to create these clean barrows. And I know there are several people in the US uh, who are trying to create clean farrows at the moment because it seems currently that there might not be any clean <laughs> yeah where yeah where we'll help you work on it anyway so yeah um i'm going to catch my breath and i think i said sex link brown about 400 times so um <laughs> terry we're ready to probably move on to some viewer questions unless tamara's got something else to say about breeding out sex link brown no, I think we covered just about everything there is under the sun about like your breeding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, perfect. I do have a better understanding of it now, so that's great. Um, oh, well, that's good because it only took an hour and a half to explain it. <laughs> that's okay. We got all night. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and uh, start taking a few questions. Guys, I'm not going to read all the comments. We, we just don't have the time for that tonight. And some of the questions, Sorry if they that. look like they're, if they're repeat questions, we're not going to uh, read every single question. So uh, let's see here. Of course, the first question is from Klaus. Uh, in order to clean fair, what are, <laughs> he says, what are the indicators you are looking for? And after how many generations can you see the difference when they are clean? 
uh, it could take as little as three generations to actually eliminate uh, sexually brown, but if you're, if you're looking for clean striations, like those stripes at the back on mine that everybody seems to admire, uh, that's something you would select for ongoing. Don't ever stop. Mm. Okay. Um, you, you, yeah, look for that in every generation. It's just something that you can keep going for as long as you breed. Okay. He's got a, uh, another question here. It says, can you see the sex link brown on Italian hens? And can you clean yep. them together with Faro, or is it better to do so apart? No, you can braid them for Faro. Yeah, yeah, if you... Ideally, you would... Uh, try to clean up your farrow line because it just does make cleaning up the other colours easier. But mm -hmm. if all you've got to start with is other colours, yes, you can use those to create your clean farrow. So breeding Italian to Italian will actually produce some farrow offspring. Okay. I think you just answered his third question, which is cleaning other mutations. <laughs> Are you crossing them to farrow? Uh, how and what are you choosing from the first generation? Ideally, always trust the feral if you can. As I said, if, if mm. you've only got uh, something else that hasn't got sex and brown, use that. But if you have feral, use that. Use the feral. And mm. I think Katie uh, covered what to look for, um, and she'll also uh, put the document up for everybody as well, instead of going over the same information. Answering questions oh. on here because I know we've been here for an hour and forty minutes. <laughs> and Klaus has another one. <laughs> he says, "Is the white collar on the Pharaoh roosters a good sign?" Yes. Yes. Okay. That's yeah, what they're supposed no to have. The bike helmet. And not yeah. many Pharaohs do. Mm. Klaus has another. Yeah, question. so that's not what we know. <laughs> It says, if you cross dirty Tibetan to a clean pharaoh, are you getting Rosetta, uh, some percentage, also clean Rosettas? Uh, the, that goes back to clean. Yes. The boys are still going to be carriers. Okay. Another question from Klaus. What are the hardest mutations? He did say clean? he's going to have a lot of questions. Yeah. <laughs> pharaoh. Pharaoh's the hardest, yeah. I, I, I don't know anybody else who has pharaohs that look like mine. Uh, so if, if I'm a, one of only a handful of people in the world that seem to have them. Right. Hmm. Uh, Marius, Hopefully I'll be joining you South very Africa. soon. <laughs> <laughs> Mario says he loved the new intro, so cool. And how are you guys doing yeah, tonight, Mario? Okay, here's another one from Klaus. Have you tested if the white color around the beak on the extended brown is dotted white or something else? No, it's it's normal part of the phenotype. Okay. Uh, yeah, the, the pesky white chin on Tibetans and Rosettas, it, it is normal. Uh, but you can breed mm -hmm. it out with heavy selection. Um, I'm on generation six and I'm still getting about one out of every 15 with it, but I'm nearly there. It's just Another one from Klaus. Cool. What, <laughs> what size eggs, minimum or max, are you choosing for incubation? I think you covered that already. Yeah, 14 grams for, for my birds, which are a, average about 300 grams these days. And then he says, thanks for the answers. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's see, you get down here a little bit. Okay, Jasmine says, uh, what advice would you give to someone who simply wants to clean up their own flock for breeding and create clean baselines for backyard quailers, specifically working with what they already have? I'm going to flip you around. Katie, I'll put you on tops. <laughs> so you're not, uh, let's see, that's me, and we're going to put you up here. There you go. I don't care if I cover my face. I don't want to cover yours. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We'll have that question again. 
Um, what advice would you give to someone who simply wants to clean up their own flock for backyard for breeding and create a clean baselines for backyard quailers, specifically working with what they already have? Uh, if you're trying to clean up sex and brown and, and dotted blood and all that, you're going to have to follow those, what KBF has said. Um, right. And if you don't have any that don't have sex and brown, there is really nothing you can do other than get another bird. Okay. Um, but if you're just breeding for your own purposes, or uh, you know you've got a particular customer base that likes a particular colour or whatever, you don't necessarily have to clean out your dotted white and your sex link brown and your other genes. If you like that colour, then use it. But what the issue is is. Um, let's just say blue, for example. So you're then, uh, you like blue, so you're going to breed blue quail, uh, blue colored quail. So your initial breeding stock has sex link brown. So all your blue quail are going to also have sex link brown. And that blue color is not necessarily going to be the ideal, perfect, clean blue phenotype that you're looking for. But if you don't mind that sex link brown colour or that dotted white, um, and dotted white is what creates tuxedos and English whites, so if you don't mind those things, or even if, if you like those things, then breed them. That's It's not an issue. We're talking about the ideal colour breeding, where if someone orders blue quail from me, they are blue they don't have any other mutations mixed into them so yeah if if you want to work with what you got and you like what you've got go with it good advice okay Katrina says what is the minimum number of individuals you work on when you clean up a line what is the ideal number uh, minimum number would be as little as two uh, and as, as many as 20 or 30. Um, I personally, sorry, I forgot to take my antihistamine today. <laughs> I personally breed about 400 pharaohs a year and I only keep 18 of them. Wow. Um, so all those 400 birds come from the spiral breeding program from those two groups, the 18 split in half and some spares. Um, so, yes, it depends on, on what you're doing. I live in town, so I have to be cautious of numbers. Yep, me too. Mm. Okay, Klaus and, um, says... Uh, I, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, so, it depends what colour project you're doing and what you're starting with. If you've only got one ideal um, or, or one of that colour, then you can start with as little as one. If you have a bunch, or if you're, if you need those mass numbers, you can, yeah, as um, tomorrow, use as many hens and roosters as you like. But you you can really use any number. An ideal, I suppose, is how many eggs you can handle. Like I, I only incubate thirty eggs a month, and so I don't have. Uh, you know, ginormous breeding groups when, you know, uh, those specific breeding groups. I just have a few that I've selectively chosen and I go with those because that's what suits my uh, breeding setup. If I had the capacity to raise hundreds of quail a month, I probably would. So <laughs> I wish I could. <laughs> okay, another one from Klaus says, if working on cleaning or eliminating something, how many chicks are you trying to hatch out? Look, um, the more the more you produce, the more selective you can be. Um, so it it depends yeah. on what you can do with them. Uh, mine sell well, and we also feed our animals on a raw quail diet. So I have a use for my excess birds. Uh, but if you don't have a use or yours don't sell well, well you're going to have to be a little more cautious. Um, but yeah, like I said, mm. to keep the 18 pharaohs each year to replace the older ones 
I hatch out about 400 of them so that I can be super selective about what I keep. Right. Mm. For a test hatch or a decent um, sort of baseline of how many you should hatch, I would say a minimum of 30. And that might not necessarily be 30 in one hatch. You might do 15 here or 10 there, you know. Um, but 30 will give you um, a reasonable idea of what you're dealing with um, for those simpler projects. Like, yeah, so cleaning up your colours. Um, I probably wouldn't do less than 30 because if you... Um, so you've got 30... You've got 30 chicks, let's say they all hatch, so uh, about 15 of them. So if you're working with um, a recessive gene or if you're working with a heterozygous um, form of mutation, about 15 of those chicks roughly are going to have it and 15 of those chicks aren't going to have it. Then from those 15 chicks that are clean or as clean as what um, you've got in that cross, uh, you've got, let's say, seven to eight, roughly, are going to be hens and seven to eight are roosters. If you're lucky, if you're me, you're probably going to get 14 roosters and one hen, but theoretically, you're going to have half. Uh, and then it depends on, if you're working with a recessive gene, then out of those, let's say you have seven hens, you're looking at three or four of them, or oh, sorry, um, well, it depends on what recessive it is, but you know, three or four of those are going to then have a big carriers and three or four of them are going to actually be clean. So, you know, you might, at those 30 chicks, you're going to probably statistically end up with only three that you can use. Okay. Okay, another question from Klaus. Uh, have you noticed a difference in egg size while feeding grow outs with a higher protein feed? longer let's say 12 10 to 12 weeks or is it just genetically given uh, yeah i haven't noticed a difference in egg size when uh, feeding them longer uh, mine go on to adult feed at six and a half to seven weeks so i i don't eat, keep them on to crumble beyond their first egg i swap them onto a layer I will have, they do, um, hens will generally increase the size of the egg they lay after their first molt. So um, a lot of people don't know this because they um, replace their birds on a, on a yearly cycle um, right. or they keep their birds under light so their hens don't necessarily go through a proper molt. But you can reasonably expect that a healthy hen who has had the chance to molt properly and have her time off will come back laying a bigger egg and sometimes it's like two or three grams bigger so yeah that's something to think about a reason to keep your birds longer okay uh, Klaus also wants to know if you have a rooster that looks cleaner but is very small would you still use him if your hens are almost jumbo size yeah if you're breeding for color I would um, select that cleaner look rather than size. Yeah. Okay. Uh, James it's just wants started to know raining you... here quite heavily, so if it if it sounds odd, it's just because it's raining. I don't hear anything. It sounds it sounds good. Okay, uh, good. James says, <laughs> "Do successful broody hens make good moms, or should we separate them?" No, separate the other birds so that they can't harass the mum and babies. Um, okay. Like if they're in a big aviary, like mine are. I will have to put some mess around those hens in the coming days so that right. the other birds can't annoy them and I'll just put um, a little water and food bowl in there and then when the babies are about three weeks old I'll just lift the mess away. Uh, and yeah, I had I think four raise their own babies. I have never gotten photos because I just leave them alone. <laughs> but um, I don't think I've ever found a dead one. They, they've done their their job and so I they do quit very easily so if you annoy them which is why I say not to move the hens if you annoy right. them they'll just get off the nest and they won't get back on so leave them be um, 
as I say, when mine had bears, I didn't even go near them other than to fill their water and food and then just left them alone. And okay. they, I think they were good mums. <laughs> Klaus says, last one, I promise. <laughs> Top three <laughs> mutations you like and you don't and why. Is there anything you would like to try? Great show and valuable information. I would love Pansy and C. We don't have them in, here in Australia. Uh, my top three would be my Pharaoh, uh, Splash, and probably Calico. All that guys. Yeah, and um, if I could have a mutation that I don't have, um, I think it would also be Fee. I do like the grey look. Um, so, yeah, Fee and, yeah, I'd probably also like to test Pansy, although I don't particularly like it. Uh, it does intrigue me. So, uh, and then my favourite mutations, oh, I do love blue. I am really liking Sandy. Sandy on Fawn is something that is sort of newish to me and mm -hmm. I even had to message Tamara and say, what the heck are these? Because that's not <laughs> what I expected. Um, right. <laughs> and so I'm actually quite liking those. Um, so Sandy, uh, that's Oz Sandy, which is not common anywhere else but Australia. Um, yeah, and I, I do love sparkly. So I'm going to say like a sparkly blue pharaoh is probably my top at the moment. <laughs> Your dream bird. Okay, Jasmine. <laughs> Oops. Uh, when separating breeders out of a large covey in an aviary, how much time should be allowed between separating them and collecting eggs for incubation to ensure you're getting what you're wanting? Three weeks. Four weeks. Four weeks. Yeah. Four weeks. Okay. Yeah, I've hatched from birds. Uh, nearly a month after I took the rooster out and they were still laying fertilized eggs mm. uh, at 21 days. Really? So if you want to guarantee that the new rooster is definitely the sire, at least three to four weeks. Yep. Yeah, and I've done similar experiments uh, where I've taken a rooster out um, so that it is just hens and collected eggs um, and at three weeks a good percentage of them were still fertile by four weeks none were fertile so somewhere in that window um, I do leave mine four to five weeks just because of my breeding schedule um, I sure. only do one hatch a month so leaving them the four weeks actually suits me sure okay Maria says uh, I got 150 mixed eggs Tibetan Italian English whites jumbos uh, tuxedo and rosetta what what is my possibilities with mixing them and is it wise to do so? It depends what you want. Uh, do you, do mm. you want a, a random assortment or do you want to replicate something that you've got there? Uh, if you want to replicate them, breed those colours together and if you don't mind what you get, then mix them all together. Mm. Um, that's definitely not how colour breeding works, so if that's a route you want to go down, you don't want to mix them. Uh, I personally don't breed spawn with extended brown at all. It's my biggest mm. bug there. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. That's more of a statement. I don't know what this one means. Maybe you guys can figure it out. Katrina says, have you put a data logger under your broody quail? I want to do this next time. I hope there is a next time to keep track of the temperature and humidity and how long they are off the nest. Okay, I, yeah. now I understand it. Yeah, no. I didn't know they no. made one of those. <laughs> I, no. I just leave them be. I, I, the I think there's a lot of things in Mother Nature that... Oh, sorry. Um, I think there's a lot of things in Mother Nature that can't be uh, replicated. When we're hatching in an incubator, we're not actually replicating what the mother hen does mm -hmm. because 
the mother hen has different she has those instincts and she is communicating with that embryo and that chick inside the egg and she there's a there's a symbiotic relationship there uh and so her temperature fluctuation might go up and down uh, the humidity is probably not going to be consistent the whole way through she is going to get up and leave and go have food and water those aren't the conditions that we're trying to um, replicate though we we're raising these quail in an artificial environment and having those variables is different to a mother hen having those variables I think the best part of having broody hands is not having to do anything. <laughs> you can be lazy. Right? Mm, and that's why I've just got my scoby ducks because apparently they're great breeders and great mothers. So I just, I can be hands off and still have duck meat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jesse says when breeding for a color 100% true, how sustainable is it in the long term before it starts causing health or aggression issues? Uh, it won't. Uh, anything in homozygous breeds true and they don't necessarily have to be even related for you to do that. You can have right. three different lines of Tibetans and just you do a spiral program, you'll get 100% Tibetans and they're not, um, you're not really closely related uh, breeding them at all. So it, that's entirely mm. up to your setup, how many birds you want to keep and how you want to do it. Uh, yeah, so once you have those digest. clean lines, you can do different um, different pairings and stuff, and that spiral breeding, which is um, still a form of inbreeding, but and a form of line breeding, but it's um, much more distantly related birds that you're breeding together. So once you have a decent number of those lines, and you can have three different breeding groups, you can do those you know the spiral breeding program right. where you rotate um each generation and but in those when you're starting out and you've only got a couple of birds and you need to use those birds to create what you're aiming for as long as they are healthy and genetically sound and they um you know it's fine to breed them because these um defects or flaws or whatever they only pop up if those breeders have those they don't just happen if you're breeding in homozygous which is two copies uh, and two copies they're not going to have any more than two copies so mm -hmm. um if your birds are already homozygous they're not going to get more than homozygous so you can sort of ensure or weed out any inferior stock by breeding closely well closer uh, as I said earlier we don't necessarily do brother sister relation uh, breedings but mm. those other line breeding techniques if you're doing it properly you're not going to end up with issues and your color aggression anyway so yeah if you're worried about line breeding split your line um, mm. go one direction with one and the other direction with the other and keep them separate and then cross them back every other generation but continue to cross them out. You don't have to have them related if that's not your jam. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, Beth says, I'm working on developing a flock of blue rosettas, which I know will never breed 100% true. I'm using homozygous blue, pharaoh, and Tibetans. Is there anything you'd recommend I do differently? You can have a homozygous blue pharaoh um, crossed with Tibetans and they will breed through. You will get a hundred percent hetero and hetero. Um, but it would mean you have to keep two those two breeding groups as they are. Um, I did something similar with uh, Rosetta Sparkly, or I do do something similar with Rosetta Sparkly. I use a Tibetan rooster over homozygous Sparkly Ferrohen, and I get a hundred percent Rosetta Sparkly. Um, so, so you can guarantee a hundred percent of something in heterozygous if you do it that way. Yeah. Okay. They Jasmine just won't breed says... true to what their parents are. They won't necessarily, you know, you've got two mm -hmm. parents that look different to what your 
100% offspring is. So um, in that yeah, not, sense, it doesn't breed true. Um, it breeds predictably and predictability is yeah. what we're looking for uh, right. rather than true necessarily. Right. Okay, Jasmine says, uh, can you share more details on what records a quail breeder would want to keep track of and the what, how, when, and why? I hear others talk about good record keeping, but they don't share the details. I have a spreadsheet on the computer, and I also have a notebook that goes everywhere with me. Um, it's like a grid uh, with the bird number, details when they were hatched, um, who their parents are, or what parent group they came out of, pretty much everything. Uh, if I've spotted a fault on them, I write it in the notes section. Um, I look at everything. Uh, I can pretty much, you pick a bird out in my yard and I can tell you exactly where it came from mm -hmm. and everything about it. Mm. So, um, and notebook. I do have a, I have a notebook that I take out with me, but I do tend to use my phone and just the notes section on my phone to record the um, the tag number or the leg band or the colour or whatever it is that I've used to identify that particular quail. Uh, and then uh, that way, because it's on my phone, I can then take a photo as well. So I keep photo records uh, and that, and then I take that information inside and one day, not necessarily straight away, uh, upload it into or just transcribe it into a spreadsheet that I have on my computer. And it depends what I'm breeding for um, as to what records I keep. Uh, some quail I don't weigh, some quail I weigh um, regularly. I definitely know the rooster, the father of pretty much all my quail. Sometimes I don't necessarily know the, the mother hen. Um, it might be a breeding group with, you know, let's say three or four mother hens. And so I will record which breeding group it is. Generally, like, often those hens are sisters or cousins or whatever. Um, so I do record what breeding it's come from if I don't know the exact lineage. But I know there's enough points of data along the way that I know the lineage of pretty much all my birds uh, mm -hmm. quite accurately, at least what bloodline they are. Um, right. And yeah, weight and size. And tags, Like we, um, I use a similar sit, uh, system to what Tamara does, which is we have numbered leg bands. So I have three different colors and they're numbered one to 100. And so different color means something. And then the number is the individual ID. Then we've got a little button sort of thing that we've sort of manipulated on that tag. So I've got 15 different colour buttons uh, and a quail has two legs. So you can have like six <laughs> points of ID on one quail if you need to. Right. Okay, Klaus lied. He's got another one here. It says, I forgot to ask <laughs> how, <laughs> how clean feral hens should how clean feral hens should look like, looks like. Um, are there more variants of clean pharaohs? And what is sex link brown actually good for? And while you guys are answering that, I've got to go take care of an animal real quick. No, they, <laughs> there's only one phenotype uh, in true wild type um, plumage pattern, and that's what those pictures were. Um, the clean face barring, light chest, hens with um, second brown would tend to have a red hue on their chest. Um, it's not so easy to see on hens and they'll also have a more red undertone all over them. Um, yeah, there really is only one look to them and that's that plate and pan. And Sorry, I just had a fly flight my nose. <laughs> Getting, it's getting hot here now, so yeah, fly season. <laughs> yeah, so um, it is definitely, yeah, that one phenotype and once you're breeding clean lines, your hens will pretty much look almost identical to each other. You do still need to keep on selecting along the way because um, Tamara mentioned polygenic genes earlier. And that's a lot of genes that create a particular 
um, trait and whether it's a physical trait or a um, or something else structurally but um, so things like the the lines lying up on the back nice and straight is likely a polygenic trait it is a it is something that is within the pharaoh quail but um, there might be a ton of little tiny things that we can't name or isolate that uh, create those straight lines on the back or the, the crispness of the mask or whatever. So um, you do still need to select as you go. Okay. Uh, Tim says, can you explain spiral breeding? Katie, okay, you're probably better at this. <laughs> <laughs> um, so spiral breeding is a form of line breeding. Basically, you have three or more groups of, uh, so three or more breeding groups that are or aren't related. Um, it just depends on how you start out. And then, so you hatch from each of those groups. Um, you give them numbers or colours as an ID, so A, B and C let's um, say for example and so you breed your group together and then you select uh, from from that group you select your the best rooster and he moves on to the next breeding group in the spiral so a the rooster from a goes to b the rooster from b goes to c the rooster from c goes to a um, and you keep and so that's every um, like every year or every breeding season or whatever that is, you replace the rooster. So the hens stay where they are and you rotate your rooster's bloodline. So it is a form of uh, line breeding in the fact that they are going to be related to each other, but they are more distantly related. So you know, it's more like breeding, breeding I think like... Oh, second cousins or third cousins or something rather than breeding um, more closely related quail. Okay. One more from Klaus. <laughs> it says, I see, Kadia, that you're using Barados. Um, are you satisfied with them? And which incubators are is Tamara using? I use Bell South 100. Um, I've got a few of them. They're a foam still air incubator and I've had my oldest one for nearly nine years now um, and it hasn't skipped a beat in all that time and they hold about 140 quail eggs each. Cool. Mm. And I love how you say that I use Barotto's and how, how do I like them as in plural. I wish I had more than one <laughs> but I do only have one. Um, so um, yeah, I like it. I think um, the Barotto has definitely improved my breeding um, just because uh, it has that consistent temperature and it doesn't matter whether it's rainy or sunny or summer or winter or whether I've got it in a drafty spot or my bedroom or my bathroom. It right. is consistent. I set it at 37.7 and it does not deviate from that. So that has improved my hatches and the quality of my quail dramatically. I have not had um, a single splayed leg or clubbed foot or, you know, oh. um, late or early hatchings since mm -hmm. I got the Barotto and I had it for about 18 months. The downside, I find it a little bit difficult to clean. The, the top part, it's a clear window and you're supposed to be able to like vacuum it out or um, shoot air, you know, the compressed air into it to clean it out. I don't find that that is satisfactory enough and I might deviate from the um, manufacturer's instructions on how I clean it. Uh, Katrina wants to know, uh, can you give an example of a hidden trait that you've seen only after several generations? Oh, uh, snowy? Yeah, snowy. Um, I had my born sparklies for five years before snowy popped up from them. So wow. from a bunch of non-diluted birds, I suddenly just must have been the right combination of parents who were carrying it. And it suddenly just popped up after years and years of not having a single dilute from them. 
Um, I was pretty confused. It didn't have a name or, or it hadn't been isolated or anything at that point. So everybody kept telling me it was C, but I knew right. it wasn't. <laughs> okay, let's see here. Jasmine says, what is the ideal timeline in a breeding program to produce a clean goal quail from stock that one already has? It depends. Um, I don't think there's an ideal timeline. I mean, I do it a lot slower than what Tamara does it because my capacity to hatch and brood chicks is only 30 a month, whereas Tamara can do 300 a month. So um, Tamara's naturally going to get to her goals faster because she has a higher capacity to breed, mm. even if we started off with the same breeding stock. So. Um, Tamara started cleaning up her EBs at the same time I started cleaning up my EBs and Tamara reached it really quickly and I am still on my way. I'm ho uh, I, sh I will have clean rosettas by the end of this year uh, and clean Tibetans early next year. But, um, you know, Tamara reached that goal a lot quicker just because her capacity is bigger than mine. And whatever time frame suits you and your setup, don't push yourself because you're just going to end up with inferior quality quail, you know, or your husbandry is going to lack or something like that because I can't, I don't have the capacity to raise any more than 30 quail a month. Mm. And right. I know that if I hatch, you know, 40 or 50 quail, that my feeding and watering and cleaning routines are, are just going to not be adequate. Okay. Um, this is a good question. Katrina says, uh, can you explain how the keel bone plays a role in egg laying? I'm going to let Tamara Generally, explain that why I go get an extension cord. Generally, uh, if there is a flaw in one piece of bone, the entire bone structure is off. You'll very rarely find a bird with dodgy hip that doesn't also have something else wrong. The keel bone is actually it's really hard to explain uh, do yourself a favor and google a diagram of it and you'll see that it actually is part of the space to allow the egg through and if that is too narrow it's not just the pelvis but the keel bone can also be stopping it hmm. so it's, uh, you know sometimes you'll pick up a bird and it'll be particularly bony along the breast, but yep. it's not actually thin, that's a protruding keel bone. That should be culled because that bird may be more, more likely to have lane issues or other bone structure issues that you might not be able to see or feel. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if I can explain that better, but basically there were studies done with chickens and I found that birds who had less than ideal keel bones were more likely, significantly more likely to have long-term laying issues and shorter laying lights. Um, and they are free studies that I found online. So you, anybody can look them up if you just Google, Google it. I know that's okay. not a very good answer, but <laughs> Google it. <laughs> hey, yeah. Okay, Beth says, at what age do you make color-based selections for breeders? that are of similar quality in other areas. In other words, when do you think the color is, quote, finished? After six weeks. Six weeks? Yeah, six weeks. Yeah, so you can start selecting early on, um, like those uh, three-week-old roosters that I showed earlier. I can tell one is potentially ideal and one is not ideal. So I'm going to get that potentially ideal. But... Um, yeah, I will look at him again um, at six weeks old uh, and again later on down the line. Um, okay. I do find with blue that they tend to change a little bit or sometimes quite a lot, um, especially blue fawn, between like five and eight weeks old. So I do select them slightly um, older. Sorry, uh, five and 12 weeks old, sorry. So um, I am 
looking at my blues once they are actually mature adults. Okay. Here's another good question. What's so bad about the sex links brown? Sex link brown. Nothing. Nothing at all. You, if you like it, you breed it. <laughs> right. Uh, it, it does hinder yeah. the natural plumage color of plumage mutations. That's why if you're a color breeder, you don't want it because you want to see the color that you're breeding in its natural glory. But if right. you like it, breed it. There's nothing wrong with it. Yeah, there's no health or mortality issues with like associated with sex link brown in itself. It is simply a plumage colour. And I think it I think the issue with it is that it is so subtle. So most people do not know that they've got it. Hence why now we have ninety nine percent of the pharaoh population has sex link brown, because that's what people associate with what is a normal pharaoh when it's actually not. So yeah, um, I actually quite like um, on like a sparkly Italian rooster. I love that red head, like that mm -hmm. full on red um, helmet. So um, I do have some sex link brown birds that I am keeping for particular purposes. Um, I can guarantee that they will never ever have the chance to go anywhere near my clean throws now that I've spent, you know, a two years cleaning them because <laughs> well, yeah i'm not going to introduce them back but yeah if you like it keep it okay uh beth wants to know if she can message you with photos of a bird that she has questions about yeah, yeah. well okay. i answer a lot of questions i think katie does too yeah yep every day if i don't get to you i'll eventually um i would like to um request or point out when people are asking for color IDs um, whether that's um, via um, PM or whether that is in a um, group on Facebook or wherever you ask your color questions that we can't necessarily see what you're seeing um, we've got a photo on a screen and so what we need at sort of minimum to make an accurate ID especially on a um, like on a tricky sort of color is we need at least three photos and they are from the side of the bird in a hole in hole so you you see from its head and its beak all the way through to its tail um, and its feet up to its back because there are markings uh, like on their on their face on this uh on their flanks uh, yeah on their side um mm -hmm. that can indicate different things so we need to see that um we need to see front on from their chest and ideally we would like to see their back as well um, and those photos need to be taken in a soft but natural light so not out in the harsh sun um, like you know, on a on a bright but overcast day out in natural light is actually probably the best um, yeah. I take a lot of my photos in the afternoon shade or the afternoon um, like uh, the soft sunlight so yeah that's going to get you the best quote if you if you send me a photo of a yeah, blurry photo of a quail running in a cage this far away and right. I can't see the chest and the side uh, I'm sorry but it's not going to be an accurate ID and I'll, I'll tell you so. all right okay I don't know how to say his name 007 says do we know where the sex link brown came from it's just a natural plumage mutation. There's sex leak mutations in, in, in just about every bird species. <laughs> it's just, yeah. The mutation okay. is mutation. It just happens over time. Okay, here's a good Some question. Some people would say it came from the pits of hell. <laughs> <laughs> uh, James says, what is the Oz gene and will it be making its way here anytime soon? It's a, which one? Uh, there's Oz Sandy is a sex link dominant and Oz Snowy is um, autosomal recessive. And uh, they have actually both been imported into the US in very small numbers. Really? So ho hopefully within a year or two, you guys will have them more available. Okay, afterwards, you're gonna have to tell me who they got imported to. <laughs> I can tell you it had nothing to do with me and it was a little bit naughty. Uh-oh. 
Yes, Ooh, and it I didn't have anything to do is. with me either. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me see. Um, hatch rates versus incubator versus a, letting a hen hatch him out. Hatch, uh, incubator, definitely. Okay. Um, more so because a hen can only fit so many eggs under a bum. <laughs> mm. Okay, Katrina had a follow-up on the keel bone. Um, basically, she'd like to see a comparison of what she's looking for, good or bad. Um, wondering if you could post something to the Caternix Corner Facebook group that shows this. Um... I don't have any poor examples, and I doubt Tamara would have any poor examples to take our own photos. And I don't necessarily want to take other people's photos and point out their flaws uh, in a public forum. Um, but uh, <laughs> we can possibly try to figure something out. It would it would be good to have um, some comparison photos, and both Tamara and I have. Um, called out poor structure before uh, mm -hmm. and it hasn't been, the, the advice hasn't been received kindly most of the time. So right. yeah, I, I do hesitate to to point out those flaws. I'd rather show you what an ideal should look like. Right. Okay. The best way to, to, to look at the kill bone is to actually feel it pick up your birds and if you feel a sharp bone even though the bird is in good condition that's a dodgy kill bone uh, you right. shouldn't mm. some of them the ones i experienced were from shipped eggs and some of them were almost sharp like they felt like they were going to cut the bird as you were rubbing the bone through the skin and the birds mm. were a good weight um you can feel that they're not supposed to be like that so Picking them up and actually having a feel of their bone structure gently, obviously, eh, is probably the best way to learn about it. Is you'll you'll pick one up and you'll go, yeah, that's that's nice. You can't feel that sharp bone, and you'll pick another one up and you'll go, wow, it's like a, a sail on a boat poking out through the bird's chest. Right. Okay. Well, believe it or not, we made it down to the bottom of the questions. I was surprised. <laughs> Um, Look at that. So, great. Okay, it is, wow, going on 9.30, so we did okay tonight. <laughs> um, let me pick our winners. We got uh, Klaus. You're going to get a coffee cup. So, Klaus, I need you to send me your shipping information. You can email it to terry at caternixcorner.com. And SOS Jones, uh, you are going to get a $50 hatching time gift certificate. Uh, so send me uh, just your email address is all I need for that. And uh, probably tomorrow, guys, I'll go ahead and upload the two images that you guys had with the uh, the conformity stuff on it. I'll upload that mm -hmm. to the server and put a link down in the description. So that'll be available. Great. So I want to thank everybody that came in and stuck with us for two and a half hours <laughs> and all the great questions. Um, I want to thank my moderators, and most of all, I want to thank you two for getting up so early to join us today, and I really appreciate it. You're welcome. So, You're welcome. Um, it's a pleasure. <laughs>